we're going to explore how you can support the institutions that we rely on by better understanding the people in them, which I think is a really unusual aspect that we don't often get to talk about in some of these programs that we all support. What I would suggest that you listen for in today's uh, panel presentation, I think most of us would agree that a lot of the approaches in Australia's development program in our region are, in terms of state building and governance, are not really fit for purpose, particularly with the challenges on the horizon in the next five to 10 years. We're seeing investments being designed. We're seeing an influx of funding. There's $1.9 billion being spent in the Pacific right now by Australia, which is an all-time historic high. But I don't know that those are quite delivering what we would like them to. We've had the international development policy, and right now there's this process of translating all of that to the development partnership plans, the country strategies. So we've got a government that's really focused right now on, okay, where do we shift our emphasis to and what works? What's scalable? And what can we hear about that we might be able to graph to different areas? So this panel is going to identify approaches to best practice, what works, and give us some ideas of what might be scalable. I'm now going to pass over to our first speakers, Professor Sinclair Dinan, who's from the Department of Pacific Affairs here at ANU, and he's co-presenting with Professor Miranda Forsyth, who's from uh, Regnet here at ANU. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak for about six minutes, so I'll do the first half of uh, this presentation with my colleague Miranda. And we're calling our presentation Community Building as Nation Building in the Pacific. Um, it's sort of based really around some ongoing research that we're doing as part of a, a large project uh, into community rulemaking, uh, something that we're seeing happening uh, really across the region, often taking the form of community bylaws, uh, often completely unofficial, but sometimes with sort of strong connections to to government. But it seems to us that this uh, phenomenon, which has been around for a long, long time, something that we've observed in other areas of our work, is really interesting and has something to say about the broader processes of state formation, <laughs> state building, nation building that are going on in very different ways in different parts uh, of the region that we're concerned about. Uh, so we're really sort of looking at something uh, as a portal uh, to, to bigger processes of social, political, economic transformation that are going on. And we think that community building as a, as a way of building nation, as a way of building state, uh, is in many respects one of the most neglected sort of topics uh, in relation to a topic that is very topical um, in terms of building effective uh, states. It seems to us that the pyramid uh, uh, if you think about it as a triangle, is often completely neglected, and that community building is a critical part of state building, and that we really need to take it a lot more seriously. And that connects, I think, with uh, the broader theme that seems to be emerging from this uh, conference around locally-led development, because communities are obviously local, and there's a lot of no local knowledge and expertise and local structures and things that work and things that don't work that need to be learned, it, learned from in order to feed into the broader process of state building. Okay. Okay, uh, the overview of um, this very short presentation is that our focus is really on, a, on a, an ongoing process, an organic uh, local level process. Uh, many people, uh, many scholars talk about order making. It's really often a response to perceptions of disintegration, perceptions of things failing, perceptions of things sort of falling down. Uh, and order making is bringing order to that situation or attempting to bring order making to that situation. The community building that we are seeing is really a form of order making, sometimes successful, sometimes less so. Um, <clears throat> it's a process that we are finding in our research is often highly dependent on individuals. 
Uh, a colleague of ours, Melissa Demian, refers to efficacious individuals. These are the individuals who take a leadership role in trying to address some of these very local problems. They're often, but not always, women. And they are remarkable figures who are often completely invisible outside of that particular community. And community building uh, is really aimed at creating security uh, and well being through holistic processes. It is not so much focused on addressing symptoms, which is often the focus of bits of state that are supposedly dealing with the kind of issues that crop up as social order issues. It is about addressing uh, issues around livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods, and increasingly uh, often about developing linkages beyond the community to bits of state that may or may not be uh, available in that particular um, area. So the, the, what we're, we're seeing are, are attempts at prevention often rather than cure. They're about trying to stop things from getting worse or growing into something that then becomes completely uncontrollable. So they have a strong preventive uh, orientation. Whoops. Okay, the broader sort of context that I'm talking about, uh, as I've alluded to, is one of increasing challenges to social cohesion at the most local level. Something that is very evident in a place like Papua New Guinea is also very evident in uh, uh, Solomon Islands and to some extent in Vanuatu, places that we, uh, that we have done a lot of our work. It's often associated, again, looking at it historically, which is very important, to a withdrawal of state, or in some cases, certainly in Papua New Guinea and certain areas of the rural Solomon Islands, to an absence of state. The state is, is very much part of the problem, uh, or its absence is very much part of the problem. And a lot of the community building that we're, we're looking at our attempts to create bridges and connections to the state. Um, the bylaws that we're looking at, the, the, the community bylaw thing, again, historically, uh, in many of these places, there is a, a long history of colonial uh, sort of intervention that has used bylaws and various sort of intermediary figures to, to work uh, at uh, developing um, some of these uh, connections that we're talking about. The kind of new threats that we're talking about today, which are often sort of uh, experienced in terms of kind of breakdown of community order, relate to, you know, marijuana, pornography, climate change, requiring um, relocation in some cases, in large parts of PNG guns, um, and the sort of feelings of, of hopelessness that go with that. Very often there's a, in, there are distinct intergenerational feelings of disconnection. Uh, and of course, there are significant areas of conflict which tend to accentuate the sort of divisions that we see accompanying socioeconomic change. We know all about Bougainville Solomons. We know less about the ongoing conflicts that are wreaking havoc across the PNG highlands and leading to enormous numbers of fatalities, injuries, and destruction of property. The responses that we are observing uh, um, Order making emerges from local level community building uh, initiatives. They focused on uh, security and safety and community governance, and they often manifest through, um, through community bylaws. Uh, order making uh, is a process, it is not a product, it is ongoing. It is often dialogic, depending on uh, dialogue, discussion, talanoa, uh, talk stories, and so on. It is relational, uh, it is structural. The community bylaws that we're observing are often part of a community regeneration that involves the establishment of committees. There is an efflorescence of committees at community level across the region. That is a really kind of interesting development. Often uh, a kind of mimicry perhaps of state form. And if you take James C. Scott's sort of famous dictum around, um, you know, looking like a thinking like a state, what we see are communities trying to be seen like a state. 
So they're adopting state form in order to uh, better connect. Now I shall now hand over to Miranda because I, I realize my six minutes is up and we'll just give some examples. <laughs> I'm a Rufus talker, so I'm going to say that we're going to keep to time after this. And I would like to just acknowledge that the slides are not working and this wonderful set of panelists is going to push on regardless. Um, I feel like I lost in themselves. Okay. Um, thanks very much and thank you. Um, Everyone, hopefully we will get the, the slides up, but if not, um, so we've, we had some examples for you of the community rules that we've been collecting across the Pacific. Uh, we've got some from Ambu community in Solomon Islands, where uh, there's in fact a big panel that is up above the village that says things like brewing, selling or drinking of Puaso, um, you know, it's, it is taboo. Um, females is allowed to wear, female not allowed to wear shorts in public. Selling of betel nut and tobacco is taboo. So these kinds of um, community rules are out there in front of the, um, the, the whole community to see. Then if we think also, um, we found a similar phenomenon when we went to Fiji in uh, the, there was rulemaking activities occurring in two urban communities in the Suva Nasori corridor. These communities were of mixed Indo-Fijian and Italke or ethnic um, Fijian communities and illegally located on government land. They've got this reputation as being places for criminals to hide out. And this creates a sense of precarity as people are concerned that they might be evicted at any time. This feeling of precarity has in, um, led these communities to create bylaws together with the input of um, the community policing and also with NGOs. We were told that these community bylaws were developed as a um, through a process of bottom-up consultation, but when we compared the examples of the bylaws that we were given from the two communities we went to, they were very similar, which makes us wonder whether or not the, um, the impact of the community policing unit wasn't perhaps um, more significant than we had been led to believe. The rules contain things such as, you know, keeping pets under control, but also no selling of drugs, marijuana and ice is named in particular, and <laughs> marijuana we found to be a constant source of um, concern in the communities that we visited. No robbery committed inside or outside of the community. Uh, and then things such as the community members will have the right to make citizens arrest with force if the perpetrator refuses to cooperate. And then also the powers of eviction are given to the community. And again, we've found these powers of eviction for a community is something that is um, very common in these rules that we're finding. And they actually parallel a lot, again, of customary ideas of banishment from the community as a way of dealing with these problems of law and order. So we've seen um, in general across the region in the different sites that we've done research so far, um, strong impulses at grassroots level to order communities, uh, resulting in dynamic, ongoing and experimental forms of governance by non-state actors who, as Sinclair said, are often seeking to attach themselves to the operations of different bits of state as they can. We see them drawing on custom and religion really as sources of authority and legitimacy. Um, but we also find that community-based actors, including chiefs, are in fact very open to discussions of human rights and rule of law and so forth. They're not presenting these, they're not framing these concerns in a polarizing way, but they're seeing a plurality, a different, a whole range of different sources of legitimacy and strength to be able to draw upon. And they're merging those in very creative ways. So we see, for example, uh, in one community, you might have rules that say uh, you can't, women can't wear trousers, but at the same time, they will be saying uh, it's illegal to engage in domestic violence. Um, our argument is that these efforts at lawmaking um, at the very local area create the fertile soil in which the state can grow. And I, you unfortunately haven't been able to notice in our slides, we've tried deliberately to bring in organic imagery 
as a way of trying to um, counter the more uh, architecture, um, you know, rigid ideas of state building um, that we've been working with. Instead, what we're seeing is in fact these very creative, um, almost ecosystems that are developing, that are able to make use of the strengths that exist in different places, are able to evolve over time. They're adaptable, they're responsive. So we started with that image of the spiders and um, building their webs. And that's what we find. The spiders are the community members, they're building their webs with whatever is around, then something comes and blows it away and then they're rebuilding again. And yet we're also finding that there is a lot of vulnerability of those community members. Some places that I've gone to and spoken with, um, you know, the, the leaders who have been doing this for some time, there is a sense of despair, a sense of we're exhausted, we can't keep on um, on doing this. And so that is um, that is a real, I think, cause for concern because this is the, the very basis on which community and state is being built. Um, so some policy implications, finally, sorry, I've got, um, we think it's important to acknowledge and support local knowledge and expertise and the way that this works at the local level to create hybrid forms of governance in ways that go beyond the mere lip service that we hear about all of the time. And for example, when we're talking about community rulemaking, this may mean giving really serious concern and consideration to thinking about giving local leaders um, real powers to do order making, um, but working on frameworks to enable this to occur in ways that do curtail potential abuses of power. Uh, we note that organic structures are more likely to have longevity than externally constructed ones. And anyway, these are happening at the moment. And so much better to be able to have a frank debate about it, to understand where are communities finding balances between community, between human rights, for example, considerations and, um, uh, and, and customary norms. For Melanesia in particular, it's critical to support governance issue initiatives at the scale that they can effectively address little problems, because it is from those little problems that the big problems escalate. And we are seeing far too much attention being paid to the end result, to the disorder that is created when things get out of control, rather than actually putting in the work to help communities to create order so that those little problems don't arise in the first place. We also note that it's clear that cultural and religious norms, as I mentioned, are being drawn upon as sources of strength, legitimacy in empowering and creative ways. Um, in fact, we are not seeing the same rigidity of thinking that often has characterized development thinking or um, lawyery thinking, and I'm a lawyer here, in terms of seeing these things in an oppositional way. We're seeing a fluidity and adaptation that we think actually should be taken and learnt from at higher levels as well. Uh, and then finally, of course, there is the real need for support for the formation of coalitions and networks, both state and non-state to do both community building and local order making. Okay, thank you very much. And huge credit to the IT support here for the, the laptop screen just went blank. You couldn't, you have no idea what it was like up the front here. Um, Sinclair and Miranda, kudos to you for being able to push through that. But I hope everyone was really able to focus on your words. This went back to the 1990s before we had PowerPoints. It did, it did happen. Um, what I took from that, the sense of order making being both prevalent within communities, but also at the state level, the fact that these organic structures are so much more powerful than those externally imposed structures. We focus too much on the end result, not enough on preventing these things at the beginning. And that sense of despair, did everyone catch that, that exists that we have to protect against? Now in the nick of time, with the slides now working, I believe, I'm gonna to pass to Dr. Abby McLeod, who's the director of ID8. She's also joined by her uh, fellow researcher here in the audience today, Mardi Grundy, who's an international development practitioner, and she's presenting their shared research because of timeframes. We have what's well-being got to do with state building. I'll pass to you now. Thank you. That's your clicker. 
Thank you, Jessica. I feel sad for you all that you didn't see Sinclair and Miranda's uh, presentation because it's really beautiful, uh, but I'm fortunate to be able to share mine with you. So thank you. It's always a real treat to discuss issues that you're passionate about with people that you know are like motivated. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity today to share with you some thoughts about the connection between staff wellbeing and organisational effectiveness. And my hope is that this will stimulate some discussion about an issue that I don't think we pay a great deal of attention to in current aid pro, uh, practice. My co-author, Marty, and I first started exploring the relationship between employee wellbeing and organisational effectiveness whilst we were working for the Australian Federal Police. Uh, at that point of time, our focus was on the culture of that institution and the ways in which it did and did not foster employee wellbeing and hence organisational performance. Subsequently, within the context of lots of different engagements across the region, uh, we've been super fortunate to meet and talk about some ideas about organisational effectiveness with a range of stakeholders. And we've been met with a really widespread cry for attention to employee wellbeing. Uh, we've benefited hugely from the opportunity to constantly discuss the ways in which Australia might practically respond to these requests with our dear friend and former colleague Latoa Falatau, who's also in the audience with us today. Uh, whilst we recognise the challenges, we recognise how crammed the agenda is, and for any of you who have designed a program, we understand there's really great demand to fit so many things into a design these days. We need to address gender, we need to address climate change, etc. So in some senses, we're reluctant to suggest that we need to address another issue. But we do truly feel that within the context of any endeavour to strengthen an institution, we do need to address the issue of employee wellbeing. We also feel that within the Pacific, uh, kind of building upon some of the issues that Sinclair and Miranda have spoken through, there's so many strengths, there's so many protective factors that promote positive wellbeing that can be draw upon, drawn upon. So we feel like the, the issue of employee wellbeing is really right for strengthening relationships between state and society and for drawing upon strengths-based and locally-led approaches. So our take home point today is that we think that the absence of intention to employ wellbeing within the context of any development program specifically intended to strengthen the functioning of an institution is a current gap in practice. We feel it's a gap that can be addressed in quite a low cost fashion and we feel that it's a gap that should be addressed. So a couple of quick caveats. Firstly, we're social scientists, we're not psychologists. Uh, we do recognise that terms like wellbeing and mental health are thrown around in quite an imprecise fashion, and we're potentially guilty of perpetuating that imprecise fashion. Our focus is on employee wellbeing. We're not looking at ill clinical mental health. We're not looking at population level wellbeing. We're looking at the wellbeing of employees in the institutions that we're very often working with to strengthen. And secondly, we're not suggesting for a second that there's nobody out there doing work addressing employee wellbeing. We're suggesting that it's not mainstreamed in the way that gender and climate change are. We're suggesting that it's not an expected component of developing programming when we're looking at strengthening institutions. We think it would be important to think about this. And if there's anyone out there with a bucket of money keen to to fund some work, we think a really great place to start would be like, let's just map what is going on out there. We know there's ad hoc little bits and pieces where innovative people have seen an opportunity or a need. And we'd really love to map what are people doing in the context of institutional strengthening exercises to address the issue of employee wellbeing. So whilst we recognise that in many contexts life occurs largely outside of the state, I think we all recognise that state building is an agenda that's here to stay. Uh, it's firmly embedded within the SDGs. Our new international de development policy reasserted a focus on building effective and accountable states. That new policy notes that effective, accountable and resilient institutions are integral to the delivery of essential services. Uh, and that Australia has committed to providing ongoing efforts to strengthen institutions, both as individual institutions and at the sector level. 
Most importantly, though, we do see the continued emphasis in national development plans and strategies of all of our partners on building strong, effective institutions and on good governance. So I think it's an important agenda and one, as Jess said at the outset, we I think we can approve the way in which we do it. I think the million dollar question is always what is an effective institution and who defines what effective looks like. Uh, I don't think we can reduce the elements of institutional effectiveness to a single slide, particularly not a slide that we could digest. Uh, but a couple of the things that we see frequently appearing in the rhetoric and narratives about strong institutions, uh, and I think we can take our lead from policy documents, we can take our lead from the way in which we articulate theories of change, uh, logics, we could get some insights into what we think inputs are by looking at the footprint of advisory support. Uh, an institutional strengthening program typically has an IT advisor, an HR advisor, a corporate support advisor, many technical specialists. We rarely see any advisor charged with thinking about or looking after employee wellbeing, and we very rarely see any efforts to work with local ways of promoting wellbeing. So we think it's a missing piece. We know that good institutions are capable. We know that they have capabilities and capabilities defined in various ways. We see the very typical constructs of does the institution have enough people to do the services it's designed to deliver? Do they have the requisite skills and knowledge? Do they have good leadership and management? Do they have adequate policies and processes, et cetera? We very really hear, rarely hear people say, are the people in that institution well? Are they flourishing? Are they connected? Are they progressing? Are they contributing? Because we all know as human beings, most of us have worked in institutions that we're at our best when we're all of those things. I've not seen many logics, theories of change, et cetera, in development programs that even acknowledge that wellbeing is an important input to institutional performance. In Western context, this is in some ways quite new as well. Uh, in our own context, we're all reforming our institutions. We don't tend to call it uh, institutional strengthening. We tend to call it cultural reform or organisational reform or more subtle language in terms of we're trying to continuously improve. Uh, we've really noticed that particularly in first responder communities, and that's the community we're most familiar with as ex-members of the Federal Police, uh, they really are shining a light on employee wellbeing. I think it's for obvious reasons. The nature of their work is dangerous. Their levels of exposure to trauma are higher than people in some other professions. But they're really leading thinking about what organisations can do to promote what wellbeing and what their responsibilities are. Uh, we found that that overt acknowledgement, though, about the link between wellbeing and performance is less prominent in other organisations. And as I said, we really haven't seen much of it at all within the context of international development conversations about strong and effective institutions. That said, the language of wellbeing, noting the caveats I raised about imprecise use of language, we're really seeing them appear more and more in the documents of our regional partners. So, for example, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific content has a particular strategic pathway on wellbeing, conceptualised at the societal level. But at the employee level, the Pacific Islands Chiefs of Police, with whom Marty Latoa and I, particularly Latoa, uh, have worked a lot, have really embedded the importance of employee wellbeing throughout their strategic planning. And in fact, I think in 2022, was it Toa, the key theme of their annual conference was employee wellbeing. So they're starting to really put it up front and centre. Uh, we're also seeing more activity. We've had a request to work with some jurisdictions to help them write wellbeing strategies. Uh, we're seeing people spend money on wellness days, wellbeing summits, et cetera. Once again, I'm talking police here. But it's becoming increasingly prominent in the language of the region that we, uh, with the partners we deal with, and increasingly prominent in terms of a desire to actually take action. I think there's no doubt at all that we, Australia, all of our development partners are facing so many challenges that negatively impact wellbeing and mental health, cost of living, climate change, gender-based violence, all shared experiences that we share. 
Historically, Australian development assistance has not really focused particularly heavily upon mental health, and this continues to be the case. We think, though, as bounded context, institutions are really nice entry points for some increased attention to mental health and wellbeing. Uh, and in our recent travels throughout the region, in addition to the, its appearance in policy agendas, we've really found and heard overwhelming evidence that this is an issue that people want attention to. So over the past few years, uh, Marty and I and Latoa have had the massive privilege of undertaking some organisational performance studies in the region. Uh, so these were studies that were requested by Pacific Police Jurisdictions and it was so exciting to be a part of because they truly were uh, locally driven. Uh, the jurisdictions asked us for them. They had a clear idea about what they wanted to do with them. Uh, and they very much drove data gathering. They helped us refine questions. And we really were just an external uh, independent voice that they leveraged to pursue things they were interested in pursuing. So we did these studies uh, first in Vanuatu. Uh, I did that one and was truly blessed, I think, by the environment that it was done in the middle of COVID, so I couldn't go in country. And that just led us to approach it in really creative ways. Uh, and I really was quite peripheral to the whole thing, uh, which was great as a researcher and an applied uh, policy person. It really made us think creatively about how you can work in different contexts. So we carried the methodology through to two other jurisdictions, Samoa Police and Tonga Police. And I think our thinking about uh, these issues was complemented by a visit Marty and I did to Solomon Islands, different context, uh, but there we heard a lot of talk about wellbeing as well. So the purpose of the studies was to create a picture of the current state of policing. Uh, we were deliberately really inductive in our methodology. So we used focus groups and interviews, but we had no idea of what a good policing institution looks like as we approached it. So we asked very broad questions of people, things like, what makes your work hard? What helps you get stuff done? What makes you feel really proud about being a member of Tonga Police? When do you feel like you're shining? When is your organisation great? And we got some really interesting data out of that. Uh, the focus groups were overwhelming. Uh, there probably wasn't a focus group during which there weren't some tears shed as people talked about their challenges. Uh, particularly in Tonga and Solomon Islands, people spoke of enormous financial stresses. Uh, the organisations were underpaid. They couldn't meet the cost of living. They were taking out loans and in debt, massive financial stress. Unsurprisingly, domestic violence was another issue raised with us as a stressor at home, but people also feeling stressed about the responses of their workplace, noting that police are are uh, highly represented as perpetrators of domestic violence and many police are married to one another. So really complicated dynamics. Uh, but people spoke at great length about really specific occupational and organisational stresses. So in the literature, we, we look at these differently. Your occupational stresses are things that are specifically related to the nature of the work you do. So I'm a cop, I go out and I see something that's really unpleasant and potentially traumatising or I'm a forensic officer and I have to do some yucky things to, to deceased people, or I'm a lawyer and I have to look at yucky images. So that's kind of occupational stress. Uh, organisational stress is more related to the way in which the organisation is led and managed. And the really fascinating thing is that the literature is incredibly clear that the greatest predictor of good or poor employee wellbeing is organisational stress or the absence of. It's not occupational. So that's kind of great news because the nature of the occupation is not going to change. Police don't do nice work. We can't change that. But we can change the way in which police lead and the way in which they manage. So uh, in my last quick minute, people spoke massively about management and leadership. So there's always two sides of a coin and against the back of hearing about all these stresses, we really, really saw that where there is good leadership and where there's overt discussion about wellbeing and explicit attention to it, the folk in those work groups, as opposed to folks in work groups that lacked that, they were motivated. 
They did have limited absenteeism. They had really high levels of interpersonal trust. They were innovative. They were striving. They were passionate about their jobs. They supported one another. And they were doing some really creative things to create happy, productive little cultures within their immediate work areas. I think anyone here who's read an APS staff survey would be unsurprised by those connections, but we've not seen that kind of evidence built up in the region. So it was really exciting to be a part of developing that evidence base uh, and really fascinating that it, it came out organically. We didn't go hunting for it. As I said, a great opportunity to take a strength-based approach. People were doing great things to draw upon strengths outside of the state and bringing that into their role as agents of the state. So people spoke to us about the way in which they leveraged their strong co social cohesion. Faith, which will be now surprising to many of you, came up time and time again as a key source of internal and organisational resilience. The relationship with the natural environment, we all know here, we all probably listen to podcasts about well-being and how to look after ourselves. And it says, get out in nature, that's better than taking Zoloft, go for a run, et cetera. And that was just part of people's way of lives. But they are really explicitly uh, explained to us the connection between that and how they recognised that it felt good. And we saw institutions talking about ways of harnessing those uh, internally to promote organisational well-being. So it's unfortunate when you're forced to rush with what you actually suggest comes next. Um, so just very quickly, I, I don't think we do as a community of practice recognise employee wellbeing as an input into organisational effectiveness. And I think that's the obvious starting point. Uh, I'd love to see some reference to wellbeing, employee wellbeing uh, in Theories of change in logical frameworks. If your if your aim is to strengthen the operations of an institution, let's talk about the human inputs into that institution. Uh, we were so surprised by how useful and the demand for staff surveys was. Uh, it really challenged our own biases. We're qualitative researchers. Uh, we had a bias that surveys in the Pacific are often not particularly helpful. We were conscious of translation issues, access issues, et cetera. We were almost forced by our partners to use them and we got representative samples. We got better samples than we saw when we were back in the AFP. Uh, and from a triangulating data perspective, it really did validate everything else we'd found. So we felt that they were reliable sources of information. Pleasant surprise. Uh, and I think ultimately, as so many people have said over the past few days, I, I think let's start by trying little bits and pieces. Um, I would love to hear about the little bits and pieces people are always already trying, uh, but I think there's low cost effective ways of just starting to acknowledge the human face of strong institutions in the region. So thank you. I hope that opens up some discussion. Sure that that's... The, the final slide actually had some of the recommendations as well there. Thank you so that's fine. Thank you so much, Dr. Abby, and also to Marty, who's in the audience in the front row here. I don't want to hear anyone in the questions mention that it's too hard to measure well-being uh, in a log frame because the Mental Health Innovation Network and the WHO 10 years ago did great work on metrics for that. So it's absolutely possible, by the way. I'm now going to pass to Ms. Ika Fernandez, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, and her colleague who's joined us online very valiantly from the early hours of the morning, Ms. Rosemane Dadang Adujani, the Executive Director of Tumikang Samasama. Uh, Ika is going to speak for 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a video as well. So please bear with us. Um, my name is Ika, and 10 minutes is not enough. Uh, for these kinds of things. So I will um, just focus on a few top line findings from a 12 year monster report we did uh, on the work of Tungkam Samasama and uh, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue done in Sulu, Philippines. So I think I'll just focus on things relevant to the conference theme, which is locally led development. Yeah, uh, because the report is coming out in January, inshallah. Um, and so my gambit is um, if locally led development truly is uh, the best way to convert dollars to outcomes, as you say, as we say, then what, what does that look like concretely when you operate in a um, uh, high stakes conflict affected environment like Sulu? Um, where uh, you have uh, both horizontal and vertical um, armed contestation, where you have 
violent extremism, although we hate that word personally uh, uh, in the Philippines, um, and where you have um, brewing uh, dynamics around maritime cross-border security issues, which our donors like PFAT are now willing to pivot more heavily towards, right? So that's my question. What does that look like in practice? So I'll spend my 10 minutes trying to talk through that. And um, I guess um, I'm glad to hear from you that the door is open for reform. Is this correct? At least that's what the DFAT guys are saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and so if the door is open for reform, um, I'm happy to deliver a good message, which is it's being done already on the ground. And that's what TSS and HD have been doing for the last decade. Um, and the fun thing is um, uh, they're doing very locally led, hyper-local uh, ways that will provide evidence. It's not just the good thing, the decent thing, but also the smart thing to do for donors like you. Okay, so um, I will focus, I think, on maybe three key messages. Um, and um, when you speak of local data development based on the experience of HD and PSS, uh, it looks in terms of three particular components, um, and it's not on my slides, no? but the first thing is on locally led implementation partnership arrangements. So uh, you'd be happy to hear that uh, TSS, well, they used to be consultants of HD uh, back in uh, like the early days in the 2000s, but they are now an independent NGO who actually during their last uh, grant funded by the EU were co-applicants to an EU grant at that level. Uh, unfortunately, DFAT, DFAT hasn't gotten to that point yet, but maybe you could revisit your, your guidelines for uh, <laughs> but the hygiene. Uh, and the second is, um, given the, the direction of localization, it's not just about team leaders who are local. Um, in the last two, uh, two cycles, um, uh, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which you guys might know is a Geneva-based, you know, very bespoke uh, mediation firm. Uh, the last two country representatives have been Filipino. So that is something unusual. And I am a Philippine evaluator, the token brown person evaluating these things instead of like a older white dude, no offense. So that's the first message, right? Uh, different um, uh, partnership arrangements. Second is uh, long-term engagement. Uh, the kind of arrangements that I just described um, lead to a, a less project-based approach, but a more portfolio-based approach, right? Because, because you're dealing with uh, actors who are embedded on the ground, who live in these communities. They are incentivized to look at, you know, more short, not short-term outcomes, but long-term relationships. Because like uh, when you do things wrong, you get shot. It's, it's that uh, strong of an incentive, right? So that means that uh, even if TSS and HD, their core business is mediation, um, the way of operating means that they've also had to de design a whole suite of, of inter interventions, a lot of them funded by DFAT as well. So from mediation, uh, coming to peace agreements, tying it to the, you know, the, the main peace tables, but also uh, leading to um, other uh, practices that have to do with education, around livelihood, around justice, um, more post-settlement holistic interventions, which are now from the logic not only of the donor, but more from what communities actually need, how Communities define peace writ large, right? And third, um, it's also now thinking about uh, monitoring and evaluation from a more localized and uh, holistic perspective, um, going beyond just what the donor metrics require, but also thinking about, you know, how do people actually define and measure success? So, okay, uh, the fair bit, a fair bit of the work I'm describing is funded by DFAT, but it's also um, tied to other uh, projects funded by the EU, uh, by the Philippine government by the UNDP and also the Asia Foundation. So um, this is something that um, hopefully we'll be able to see uh, where we do evaluation and evidence gathering not only from our perspective, but also seeing how our other colleagues uh, measure their, their own bits of the, the bigger pie. So I won't speak to this context. I think if you're here in this room, you would know a bit about Nindanao maybe, at least uh, in, in the context. No, but it's only, uh, Sulu in particular, that tiny red dot over there is only 1,600 square kilometers, but it does um, provide a, a very interesting laboratory for these kinds of, uh, of interventions uh, in terms of the peace processes with the, MN the Moral National Liberation Front, uh, with the global war and terror with Abu Sayyaf for a bit, and then with cross-border maritime security, given its proximity to Malaysia, Indonesia, and other fun bits. So it's very strategic uh, to work in, but also very difficult to operate in. And so TSS and HD's experience um, maybe has been the best and longest at it um, compared to other partners who honestly would not be able to go in there without getting kidnapped. So um, given this, um, even as an evaluator, um, what we've had to do is to look at... Uh, 
treatment effects for local users at a more community level. Uh, and that means for me, uh, looking at more hybrid arrangements, no, because that's actually the, what the value add of HD and TSS has been. Uh, they have been able to combine technologies from you know, Geneva-based global experience, from multiple peace processes all over the world, but also more homegrown uh, mediation mechanisms that, uh, that the Osugs have been doing for decades, oh, sorry, centuries since the 14th century, um, actually. Uh, so they've been able to, uh, to find ways to take what the Taosugs have been doing for the longest time, but qualify it uh, in terms of what you have in terms of conflict analysis, conflict mapping, uh, link analysis. And then I think most interestingly, uh, tying these mostly verbal peace agreements into actual legal arrangements. So at this point, TS has been able to um, uh, convince the local judges to take on uh, these signed agreements as um, something that's legally admissible in Philippine court. So having that kind of perspective that it's something that the community will, will find acceptable, it also is visible and legible to Western and, and Philippine national uh, policy, whether it's by, by the judges or by the police or the military. Um, at the same time, it's something that um, ties to broader interventions that, that goes beyond just um, uh, these kinds of peace agreements, but what happens next? Because um, the fun thing about the long uh, timeline was that we were able to go back to people we they worked with uh, 10 years ago and asked, so what, what actually changed in your lives 12 years after? So, okay, fine. We we kept you from killing each other 12 years ago. What, ha what actually changed beyond that stopping uh, after the ceasefire? So um, at the same time, this is what... Um, I guess it's also one major top line finding because it's such a long term uh, portfolio based approach. Uh, we've been um, well. They've been forced to think about uh, the elements of peace that are not necessarily within the indicators of HD or even DFAT, but now linking it to other aspects like education, also funded by DFAT, uh, livelihood, also funded by DFAT, and then also uh, more tricky bits around uh, linking it towards more peaceful and uh, electoral ways of working beyond just uh, the armed group arrangements. Uh, although obviously um, it's still early days, uh, these kinds of interventions um, were already planned. 12 years ago, but for various reasons could not happen, either because there was no money available. People didn't believe that um, that um, a mediation group could actually be a, a good um, conduit for these kinds of things. And honestly, I guess the broader context of the Philippine peace process wasn't there yet, but now it is with the Bangsamoro. And so I think uh, with, with the kind of intervention that's happening in Sulu, there is this kind of model where, um, in the words of our partners on the ground, it's it's not just a, you know, a project, but a assembling the pieces of a peace pie, you know, seeing that mediation is only one part of it, but then you have to lock it in with other things that will convince people to not go back to war. And that includes legal uh, livelihood and other interventions that ties to what uh, my uh, panel co-panelists were speaking of around order making and something a bit more stable for the long haul. So uh, part of it as an evaluator was also trying to expand the the frameworks for indicators beyond what DFAT and the EU were asking for. Because honestly, and uh, prior to our evaluation, they were still, you know, tied to um, to particular uh, log frames and metrics tied to the donor program. So part of um, what the evaluation came up with was a new set of indicators coming from uh, the locals. And this is a safe space, no? Um, yeah. It includes <laughs> indicators that uh, might be a bit gray, <laughs> including, for example, how uh, something called biat, blood money, uh, comes into play. And so part of the overheads have to do with facilitating certain agreements because they, you know, um, through blood money payments, for example. And that's actually a major indicator that uh, it's not part of what you'd report to the EU, <laughs> but, but, but it is a major part of, of what makes it possible and builds trust on the ground, right? Uh, at the same time, you have all of these different components that have to do with um, mobility and displacement because you have long-term displacement across decades, no? And being able to track that from a more, a more long-term point of view beyond a ceasefire is something necessary, which actually will work not only for Sulu, but even for mainland um, Mindanao and also other sites where you work in, right? Because you have people who are now uh, in a state of of, uh, of constant displacement. So you have a certain, uh, an urban planner by training. You tend to shape the space of, of, your, of the places you work in differently because of the nature of the conflict. And so that is not part of the FATS in Kibors, but for them it is. So now thinking about this broader frame, I think will be necessary, and but also it's very difficult because in terms of capacity, um, these kinds of mediation groups are very small and bespoke and therefore usually don't 
have you know trained M and E specialists. So maybe part of the work is, and I'm glad I know there's some people here who are going to be deployed to HD to help with that. Is that uh, if there's capacity building to be had, help them build the systems to collect their own data in their own terms. Yeah. So it's also a kind of uh, uh, helping them think through what they want, helping them reframe their data in a structured manner, uh, but also not imposing certain things or even allowing them the space to hide certain indicators from you if they need to, legally, of course. <laughs> so I won't go through this, but it's really fun. No? Uh, we have a, a good enough deep data set of both qual and quant data, which I really hope we'll be able to release more, more data on by, by next year. Um, and it's the fun thing because we because we did a more localized uh, community approach to evaluation. We have analysis for for each Kauman or community site. So, for example, this place uh, which is more rural, uh, Kalingan Kalawang, is where you have the more National Liberation Front. Um, that was the birthplace of the MNLF and has a particular kind of tenor because um, I think um, most of the women here are all widows because their husbands uh, mostly died during the Zamboanga siege in 2013. Um, and so we have a lot of orphans and widows there, a different kind of, of metric. At the same time, you have Indanan, where you have like the major MLF camps, but also a lot of uh, hardness against uh, the, the Americans, because uh, after 9-11, you had quite a bit of operations here against the Abu Sayyaf that ended up killing quite a few um, people. <laughs> um, and so, but the thing is, though, my other part of the, the thing is that because you have this kind of deep engagement and trust, you're, you have like a baseline to stack on. And what, one of the things they've been able to stack on is uh, a certain level of security coordination with uh, the military, with the police, uh, with the local government, with the ulama, uh, and, and with obviously the community, including those hard to reach actors we don't talk about. And so this is something that we're, uh, they're now trying to get uh, signed by the Philippine government. Um, it's a joint monitoring mechanism that not only um, helps with with coordination, with information sharing, with uh, deterrence uh, and police operations, but um, it's something that can be used to, to formalize agreements which are mostly informal in nature because for those who work in the military, for example, um, the AFP and other militaries tend to rotate quite quickly. And so if you have a very uh, smart military person, um, they will be not so counterinsurgent, but if you want somebody to use out for their stripes, they will destroy everything that the previous commander had built. No? Um, so uh, having these kinds of more formal agreements to lock in previous arrangements is necessary, but so far has not been signed yet. So I think it's part of the reason why I was asked to do this presentation to help do the push, uh, starting with the donor side, to, to get this signed properly. Because uh, in the mainland, you have the, the peace agreement with the more Islamic Liberation Front has a ceasefire mechanism. It's something that has extensive uh, architecture, but for the islands with the MNLF, it does not. So yeah, so things like this, right? Being able to, to get this on paper. And so I end with, with this particular presentation. Um, these are things uh, that are necessary, I think, for a world beyond agreements, or a world beyond signed documents that no longer exists. <laughs> and so being able to expand the way we work and, uh, and honestly, again, uh, in these um, very fragile situations, locally led, this is the only way to go. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. I'm Ms. Rosemane Diversa Abdiraji. I'm the Executive Director of Tulikang Sama Sama Incorporated in the province of Sulu Bar. TSS is a pool of native um, local of Sulu mediators, a Filipino non stock and non-profit organizations. TSS is also has deep networks within both MNLA factions, political, and clan leaders. And um, TSS possesses unparalleled knowledge of the solo situations. That's simply because the trust and confidence within the community all over the province of Sulu, um, trust and confidence has been established by the Tumigang Sama-Sama to all stakeholders 
that we are partnering with or far remote areas that can be reached by our services in terms of mediation and dialogue. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dadan, who's also joining us online. Thank you, Ika. That was fantastic. And I'm sure everyone here is looking forward to the report coming out in January um, and acknowledging a world beyond the signed agreement. And it's definitely a safe space. If we can't talk here about the nature of the problem, then where can we talk about it? I'm now going to ask uh, Ms. Henrietta McNeil, who's a PhD candidate here with the Department of Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University, to come and present her work on Balancing Development and Regulation, the Case for Vanuatu Citizenship by Investment. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jess. Uh, kia ora tato katoa, uh, hello. Um, today I'm pre presenting the first tranche of um, an analysis, so just the media analysis today, from a project that examines Vanuatu's citizenship by investment scheme, um, and this is with Grant Walton, who's hiding up the back. Um, Pacific Island states have long sought passive investment revenue schemes, uh, streams through regulation to generate economic development. There has been significant media attention paid to Vanuatu's uh, CBI, so Citizenship by Investment Scheme, over the decades since its inception. This discourse, we felt, was ripe for a critical analysis about how international media frames um, the scheme, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, which are both significant donors. There are two prominent media framings um, apparent in the donor media. So independent economic development. So about how developing countries generate income to fund their own development priorities. So when we're talking about locally led development, that's that's the, one of the ways of doing this. The second is geopolitics and governance, or what we're calling the security governance nexus, which formulates a narrative highlighting concerns about security, e external influence, foreign interference, and highlighting concerns about um, mischaracterized failing states. We find that while there is some discussion about the independent economic development benefits of Vanuatu's CBI scheme in the wake of disasters, overwhelmingly international media tended to subsume discussion of the scheme into existing security concerns around geopolitics and governance, which we argue creates an environment that justifies security interventions rather than development approaches. And this is not to say that there are not challenges for the CBI scheme but that the discourse is skewed and doesn't really enable an environment for development support. It should be noted that CBI is not illegal. It's not the illegal sale of passports. They can be purchased by anyone with the money and it's not necessarily illicit or nefarious. For states of the global South, they generate substantial uh, government revenue. Vanuatu's early scheme closed after September 11th like other schemes worldwide, as they were discursively linked to terrorism. But the program was re-established in 2014, targeting Chinese nationals with passports costing $130,000 US for an individual or $180,000 for a family of four. Uh, seeking development funds after the devastating effects of Cyclone Pam in 2015, the Vanuatu, uh, the Vanuatu Economic Rehabilitation Program was reinstated opening citizenship by investment up to wealthy foreign citizens, um, firstly targeting Chinese, but afterwards everyone. Following criticism, these programs were closed and replaced by new, but similar, programs targeting the same groups. The schemes contribute to between 28 and 40%, depending on the year, of government, government revenue, and approximately 5 to 12% of GDP. We drew upon Joanne Sharp's notion that geopolitics is both reproduced and influenced by media discourse. The literature basically states that media reporting helps to legitimize foreign policy and even justify security and development interventions by foreign governments. We're not implying that media framing is entirely causative of particular interventions on the scheme, but we do argue that media framing provides an environment for understanding the scheme and rationalization to act accordingly. Media reflections of development are often based in preconceptions and stereotypes. To Katerina Tarawa's point on screen, um, historically, Australia has fatalistically considered the Pacific region as failing states, I don't like that term, with corruption challenges in close proximity to the Pacific region, uh, to Australia's borders, sorry, which could fall under the influence of external great powers a view which did contribute to the Ramsey intervention in Solomon Islands and ha which had a large focus on governance and corruption. 
And while it effectively secured peace, there remain questions about how much it affected corruption. More recent geopolitical framings of the Pacific region focus on the escalating US-China power tension, um, shifting over the past decade, particularly from an ex to an explicit focus on strategic competition and security. In 2022, the Lowy Institute poll found that 82% of Australians were in favor of increased development aid to the Pacific region, and I quote here, to help prevent China from increasing its influence in the Pacific. They said that that was affected by recent media coverage of the Chinese foreign minister's tour. So citizenship gets drawn into these geopolitical framings. More than 60 countries worldwide have citizenship or residency by investment, including Australia and New Zealand. However, media have coined CBI as golden passport schemes, which is said to give rise uh, to serious compliance issues and risks of money laundering, corruption, and tax evasion, and facilitate the movement of criminals. And that particularly comes up when there are geopolitical issues, like the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. On this basis, countries stop visa waiver agreements with countries that sell citizenship, request, request additional restrictions on the programs, or place sanctions forcing further negative economic development implications on the state affected. So what we did was we looked at three media outlets, RNZ, ABC, and the Australian edition of The Guardian. We created a corpus of 71 media articles over the last decade from these uh, about uh, Vanuatu passports um, and citizenship. Uh, we excluded ones that didn't talk about CBI. Basically, coverage of Vanuatu's CBI scheme is not frequent outside of these outlets, or really outside of Australia and New Zealand. So we realised that the effect that these particular media outlets have on framing the issue internationally is quite significant. So to the independent economic development um, aspects of it, the scheme, Vanuatu is the world's most at-risk country to national has natural hazards. It's been badly damaged by cyclones Pam, Winston, Gita, Harold, Judy, Kevin, and Lola, those last three just in this year alone, struck on a regular basis by earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and felt the economic and human security impact of COVID-19. Rebuilding from each disaster, and that's pictured here, um, really costs. Cyclone Pam costs 60% of GDP. Therefore, Vanuatu has sought ways to finance recovery efforts, including through CBI. Within the corpus, though, only one-fifth of references related to the econo independent economic development benefits of this scheme. Independ initially, these were when the scheme was re-established and highlighted the economic results of the scheme. Um, but most of the references were in 2021, when CBI was, and I quote here, funding COVID-19 bailout packages and cyclone recovery and contributed to almost half of government income. Indeed, in 2020, despite the simultaneous crises of cyclones, volcanic eruption, and COVID, the $84.6 million, that's US, revenue from CBI over seven months enabled a budget surplus. Vanuatu was one of the few Pacific Island states that had a strong fiscal response to, to COVID-19, and that demonstrates the development importance of the scheme. But positive media references only appeared in the wake of a disaster even though the fiscal stability that CBI brings between disasters wasn't mentioned. Instead, over two thirds of the corpus references were linked to geopolitical or security governance concerns. Just under half of these references were to governance issues like money laundering, corruption and mismanagement and facilitating criminal movements. I'm gonna talk about these. Concerns about money laundering arose when there was talk of the government accepting Bitcoin for passports, making it harder to trace money transfers. Although Bitcoin was discontinued within days of the announcement, its legacy has remained in media references and a general distrust of the scheme. Notably, all the references to money laundering were speculative about what this scheme could facilitate, as in this quote above. But there were no actual prosecuted cases mentioned. Without prosecutions reported, Media references linking money laundering and CBI appear to be rooted in supposition. Notably, Vanuatu's ongoing efforts to address money laundering over the past two decades went completely unmentioned. Concerns about corruption and mismanagement of the scheme were prevalent in our corpus. When the scheme was re-established in 2014, there were concerns about, there was a previous um, 2011 illegal sale of passports, but that wasn't CBI, so that was raised. Um, 
There were also concerns about the limited checks and balances, particularly when the sales process was outsourced to foreign companies and it was unclear who would make profit. There were also political claims about following proper process and the only checks on the individuals applying by, being by the FIU, the Financial Intelligence Unit, which, and I quote here, was totally inappropriate. Uh, FIU obviously doesn't have the capacity to undertake proper due di diligence. Since Australia threatened to cut aid to Vanuatu in 2004 due to corruption and poor governance, there have been significant anti-corruption efforts, including 14 corrupt MPs jailed in 2015. Since 2017, Vanuatu has significantly increased spending on governance institutions, including the FIU, and an anti-corruption agency is due to be established soon. Again, these efforts are not acknowledged in media reporting. The other negative framing by the media was concerns about exactly who is getting a passport. Focus has been on organised criminals or the potential for transnational criminals to use the scheme to circumvent law enforcement in other countries. Stories about serious criminals attracted sensational headlines and detailed the, criminal of, uh, the criminality of these particular individuals. But from what we know, many of these individuals committed their crimes after gaining citizenship, meaning that there was little authorities could find when processing the application. For those that, that it, uh, had committed their crime prior, their citizenship was revoked when it was later found that they hadn't fully disclosed this criminality. Passports purchased through CBI schemes are not necessarily for nefarious purposes. Um, in a rare instance, one article did provide some nuanced commentary, stating that, and I quote here, not everyone who wanted citizenship of another country and could afford to buy it was necessarily of bad character. Purchased citizenship can provide personal safety, facilitating a new life to avoid political or economic threats. So while the reported criminality by individuals holding Vanuatu CBI is really quite concerning, the number of CBI holders profiled for criminality in the news articles appears to be quite small. So we worked it out to be 0.45% of 2020 sales, which may indicate, and don't necessarily have the data on this, that the vast majority, so only 9.55% of clientele to Vanuatu CBI um, are not purchasing citizenship for nefarious purposes. But more than half of the CBI's geopolitical media attention went to the fact that the overwhelming majority of citizenship applications are from Chinese nationals. Probably unsurprising, given that the government particularly targeted the Hong Kong market. 54.5% of passports sold in 2020 were to Chinese nationals. Much of the concern was about whether or not Chinese individuals who purchased CBI entered or resided in Vanuatu. However, it's estimated that only 1 in 10 of Chinese clients actually ever visit Vanuatu. Vanuatu immigration data showed that very few people used their new citizenship to actually take up residence. So despite the increase in sales, in passport sales, Chinese visitors to Vanuatu hadn't actually increased. There are some concerns about the level to which China is exercising power extraterritorially in Vanuatu, including over those who hold Vanuatu CBI. In 2019, six Chinese migrants were detained and removed from Vanuatu by Chinese officials over their potential involvement in a cryptocurrency Ponzi scheme. Four of them held Vanuatu CBI, which was revoked when it was found they hadn't discussed, uh, disclosed their prior criminality. But the incident was repeated, uh, re reiterated repeatedly in the media, linking concerns of Chinese influence with CBI. Um, almost there. So in the media discourse surrounding the scheme, we found that only one fifth of references were to independent economic development and two thirds were to geopolitics or security governance nexus. Probably unsurprising that the media is gonna to gravitate towards sensational stories, but it does portray a skewed view of the scheme and create polarization. Putting in issues of governance, particularly corruption at the fore of media discourse invokes Australia's fear of failed states within the current geopolitical environment. And while there are some very genuine issues to address around due diligence, by moving the public discourse away from the financial benefits of CBI, there is a risk that the motivation, the independent economic development benefits of the scheme will be undervalued by donors. And to quote a Pacific development and security scholar, Maima Koro, external focus on donors' security agendas have disrupted the media's development, uh, has dis disrupted donors' um, development priorities. So, with donor attention fixated on China, and the media's too, there is a risk that Vanuatu's development motivations are lost altogether. And this skewed discourse creates an environment where donors only see security concerns, 
and where partners are encouraged towards actions in the name of security, sanctions, blacklists, revoking visa-free agreements, rather than supporting the scheme as a revenue stream for economic development. Excuse me, development. Punitive measures against the scheme may actually have the opposite effect to those intended, with potential flow-on risks should the government of Vanuatu seek to replace this income with foreign income streams with, for, with similar sovereignty impacts. So I'll finish up, oh, whoops, finish up there. Um, but just, uh, uh, I guess the thing to leave you with is to consider how the media is framing these issues and if that is actually, um, should be affecting how, how we do development and whether it's a security or a development issue. Thank you. What an excellent point. I'm gonna ask our panelists to come up to the front. There should be six seats at the front. We have a glorious 15 minutes for lively questions. I was hoping to get you 30 minutes. My apologies, we were thwarted. I'm sure there's burning questions in the back of all your, your minds. Some of the things that sprung to mind to me were what were the gender dimensions that have emerged from the research? To what extent are young people involved in order making or community building? And can we hear more about the local capacity in a lot of these efforts? But those were just mine. So um, I'm going to, I have the chair's privilege of avoiding any questions today and giving it to the floor. I'd love you to raise your hands, say where you're from. And if you can direct a question at a particular panelist, that makes it a lot easier to mix and match today. Could you please raise your hand if you have a question for the panelists? I know there's one at least. We'll take them in batches of three. Okay, I can see one, two, and then three. We have Anna just here in the front row. So two in that row and then one here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Christine Lindell, a Conflict and Fragility Advisor at World Vision. Um, thanks to all the panelists for really interesting presentations. And I'm obviously just happy to have a panel on this topic at ASC this year at all. Um, there was an interesting theme that I saw popping up actually across several of the panelists, if I can, it's sort of a question in general. Um, and it's about the role or the centrality of the state and state capacity in these discussions of fragility. Um, so I guess a very state-centric view or state, state fragility lens is something that for me, I associate very much with uh, Afghanistan vibes sort of mid early 2000s and that focus on building states building state capacity as as the primary means of, of combating fragility um but i think also in afghanistan we saw the downsides of, of putting all our eggs in one basket and that way when you have a change in government a dramatic change in government you, you lose a lot of that that progress and, and since then i think a lot of the discussion on fragility that, that I've seen in other parts of the world has, has looked at fragility in multiple levels, at, at community level, in, in markets, a sort of holistic view and a very local focused view. Um, it could be though that, I mean, we're talking about the Pacific here, that, that something about Pacific fragility is different, that a, that a more state focused approach is appropriate. I thought it was really striking in the first presentation, the whole thing was about local capacities, local governance, but the end goal still seemed to be about uh, a fertile ground for, for state engagement. Um, so I'd be, I'd be interested to hear, really looking at this on the face, do the panelists think that as it's currently also kind of reflected in DFAT thinking that a very state focused approach is the right one to take on fragility in our near neighborhood, or should we be looking at these more multi-level holistic approaches? I'll be very interested in the answer to that question from the panelists to your left. Thank you. Hi, Anthony Bailey, the Vanuatu Skills Partnership. Henrietta, I'm just curious in your research, are you looking at local discourse about the scheme through mainly social media like Yumi Talk Talk Straight or you know the Daily Post and what you know what that might be telling you also about about the scheme. Great question. Um, just here in the brown shirt, Anna. Thanks very much, and I just want to first thank uh, um, Abby for the really practical suggestion of um, building in well-being as an indicator for DFAT program logic. So someone who's in works in design, so that's just a fabulous um, practical takeaway. Um, but my question is actually to um, um, Sinclair and um, Miranda, just uh, you made a, a reference to um, in your research, uh, the, the positive influence that cultural and um, religious norms had on community and state building. And it would just be great even just to have, you know, one practical example of, yeah, that would be a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, over to you. 
Who'd like to go first? Okay. Um, thanks very much for the question. Um, not in this presentation, um, but overall in the project, yes, we are looking at um, particularly Vanuatu Daily Post, and obviously that's had some um, interesting um, experiences, particularly with that um, 2019 uh, uh, deportation of, of Chinese nationals who held CBI. Um, we're, we're incorporating that into a, a larger part of the project where we're actually heading to Vanuatu next year to do um, interviews and things um, to, to really see the, the on-ground uh, views. Uh, this was just uh, to understand how donors are approaching it and what information they're receiving. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks very much for the question about um, fragility, which is a great question. And I don't think there's a straightforward answer to it, but I think, you know, that there certainly is a, a focus on state fragility in, in, in this particular region. Um, and that's possibly for, you know, fairly obvious reasons that in, in parts of the region, the state just isn't there. Um, and that, I think, is to do with uh, a very particular history, uh, colonial history, uh, sort of deeper issues around state formation. Um, and I think a lot of the sort of survey uh, work around uh, issues like access to justice, um, as well as sort of illustrating um the strong evidence that people have alternate ways of you know dealing with disputes and issues that there is nevertheless a strong demand and in fact a growing demand for increasing engagement with alternate sort of ways of dealing with issues so mainly state so i think i mean what you see in the region um is both a call for a recognition of levels of autonomy at the local level to be able to deal with things using local resources but at the same time for a state that people can actually engage with because in many parts certainly of the melanesian pacific there is no state to engage with and that is a a, a massive source of frustration i think for many many people um in terms of how we view it and how we try to present it was that there is a state centrism uh, certainly in the rhetoric and in a lot of the policy uh, engagement that completely ignores the fact that states are more than just sort of institutional constructs. States are relationships, they're ways of thinking about how you relate in a particular polity. And um, what I've just been talking about is, is people's sort of expression of the need for that relationship to be developed. Um, so really, I mean, I would cover that in terms of state society relations. The two areas should not be seen or two domains should not be seen in polar terms, in binary terms. That is the problem. Um, they should be seen as sort of mutually dependent. Um, and the sort of transformations that are required are both in terms of the state and society, but in particular the relationship between the two. That is the, is the nexus between state and society that in the part of the world that we work in is, is deeply problematic. And what we're observing is an attempt to address some of the problems in that relationship. I might just talk to the, um, the last question. Uh, we find that custom state law, so the ideas of the constitution and human rights and um, and Christian principles form almost all of the rulemaking that we've seen, but in different proportions. And so in some places where it's being driven more by church groups, then you've got much more of an emphasis on um, on sort of the sanctity of marriage and, um, and yeah, so, so those kind of um, um, rules, morality kind of, of rules, whereas in other places where it's driven more by NGOs, for example, then there'll be more about domestic violence. But whatever the emphasis, you'll there will always be a sort of um, elements of those different dimensions, so those different sources of legitimacy. Um, and we are seeing more of that being articulated in terms of we're working out compromises depending on the particular situation, on the particular place that the community is at. Um, so for example, I was in Vanuatu earlier this year 
And um, I learned about a new initiative where the Vanuatu Council of Chiefs, um, sorry, where the Vanuatu Council of Churches, the Port Vila Town Council of Chiefs and the um, community policing were doing awareness about community rulemaking in the Port Vila municipal area and talking with communities um, to, about how do you address, you know, common cases of domestic violence, for example. The point of all three of them going together to do this awareness building was to say, we're all singing from the same, you know, song sheet here. We want to support each other. I spoke with the Vanuatu Women's Centre who were saying chiefs are bringing in women to the centre to support them. The chiefs are working with them. First of all, they're not able to address the problem, so they're bringing them to the centre for assistance. So these kinds of creative supporting um, networks are being built up at the local levels in ways that I think are, are really exciting. Fantastic response. We have time for a couple more questions and I'd like to acknowledge that we have, please, so one microphone there and while everyone else is thinking, we have several Pacific experts in the room, we would love to also hear from them. Uh, thank you, insightful uh, panel. Um, my question is from Sinclair, Miranda and also Abby because historically state building has been a bloody process, especially in Western Europe, state building is equivalent or if it's equivalent to war making. My question is coming to the experience of Melanesians. Uh, so when we uh, focus on see community building as a state building, it's a bottom-up approach. So how would you see that the conflict between national institutions and those uh, local level, let's say institutions, or informal norms and values, the conflict. And the second one issue is in terms of the experience, because um, most of those institutions, I mean, national institutions were replicated or transposed by um, colonial powers. So they didn't go through uh, this, the process of state formation. How do you see that? And coming to the stress, uh, question of the stress of the employee, state building is quite a difficult process. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, naturally that uh, involves lots of challenges and uh, would impose stresses on employees. Anyone engages with the state building, how do we see at uh, the bigger picture? Thank you. Great question. We might pass to Abby first and then we'll just to reverse the order. You have a mic just in front. It's a really interesting question. I Look, this is a guess and assumption on my part, but certainly in my experience of dealing with police in Pacific policing institutions, I don't think their concept of their reality is that they're part of a state building process. I think their lived reality is we're cops. We're doing our work of being cops. Uh, are those cops sometimes in, involved in an engagement with an external donor that's bringing different ways of thinking? Absolutely. I agree with you entirely that by and large, those policing institutions are continuations of colonial institutions. That's difficult. I see that play out in really visceral, obvious ways. And the most obvious thought for me is thinking about police in some of the Melanesian countries I've worked in who have a quite different notion of what constitutes right and wrong, be it criminal right and wrong or just moral right and wrong, obviously different conceptions of individual versus group responsibility, different desires from the outcomes of the justice process. So I think from a state building perspective, that's really complicated. I just don't think that their worldview, in my experience, is that they're part of state building. They're just doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's thank you. I, I think probably the view of what is the state is something that is, again, an organic um, process in, in many parts of the, the Pacific. And it's probably a very different um, understanding to, as you're saying, sort of in the, the European birth of the state. Um, what we find in our research is that there is a desire for more state in many of the communities that we go to and that communities are often 
creating these forms of governance in a way that is going to be um, legible to the state in order to uh, negotiate for more support, for more services from the state. So there is that um, real desire to work in partnership uh, with, with those bits of state that, um, that are functioning well. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> big sort of difficult set of questions. I think, um, you know, what you point out about, you know, the, the, the sort of contested na nature of state formation, you know, is, is a well-established fact. And that has to be, uh, I think, contrasted with a view in certain quarters of the, the policy community, which it, it's something that can be achieved in a very neat, sequential, Bob the, Bob the Builder kind of way, you know, which traditionally, I think, has informed international interventions. And I think Ramsey is a perfect exemplar of that. Uh, state building is contested, it is messy. And I think what we are observing to put our research into that picture is the negotiated character of state building. We are seeing negotiations occurring at the most local level where people are saying they want to be part of this state or they want to have a relationship with this state, but they want to have it on their own terms. And, and that is really interesting. That is part of state formation. And it looks differently in different parts of the same place. Um, it's extraordinarily complex. It's organic, it's fluid, it, 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 it is highly contested. And a place like Papua New Guinea, which is really numerous different countries, it is resisted in some places, it is sort of appropriated, engaged in very enthusiastically in other places. Um, it, it's very difficult to see it as a uniform, neat, sterile, uh, kind of sequential process, which if you look at some of the, the policy documents about how to build an effective state in a place like Solomon's uh, over the last 14 years of Ramsey, you know, appears to be, you know, it's coming from a different planet. It's totally unrealistic. Um. I'd like to thank you all for your time today. And I hope some of those messages stay with you for the rest of today. I couldn't agree more. I'm so delighted there was a panel on this topic this year of all years, but also each of those presentations could have been an hour long. Please join me in thanking 